recording before um, introducing the title. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for student feedback and co-creation for equitable teaching and learning. I'm Hannah Jardine. I'm one of the teaching and learning specialists here at the Center for Teaching, Research and Learning, also an adjunct for uh, the School of Education. And I will pass it on to my co-presenters to introduce themselves. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Fromey. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a graduate student uh, working with the teaching and learning team at, at CTRL. Um, thank you all for joining us. And we are joined today, very special guests, uh, extra special guest stars today um, by two of our uh, student partners. CTRL has, if you didn't know, a, a student partners program. Um, currently, there are um, five student partners, um, of which we have two. Uh, would you care to introduce yourselves? Hi, everyone. My name is Reba, and I'm a junior. Hi, everyone. I'm Katsia, and I'm a senior in the School of Education. Thank you both Katia and Reba for joining us. All right, so before we get started, just a few quick guidelines for participation. So throughout this workshop, uh, we ask that you make yourself comfortable. So do whatever you need to feel comfortable. I know it's the um, end of the day or close to the end of the day, in the middle of the week, um, be present. So participate in activities in a way that works for you. We'll have times where you can ask questions, share ideas in the chat. Um, and up to you know what you may or may not be doing right now, um, just engage in a way that works for you. And if you'd like to speak out loud, especially considering this is a relatively small group, um, you can use the raise hand function to speak and um, we'll unmute you. And please be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. Uh, we're here to learn from and with each other today. So, um, also for some context for this workshop, the reason why we're doing this so soon in the semester already, the middle of week three, is that a really big point we want to make today is how important um, student feedback is very early on in the semester. Um, so the, a lot of the ideas we'll give you today are things that you can apply starting tomorrow, um, starting in these early weeks in the semester to kind of set your semester off on a positive note. So with that, I'd love to hear um, from those of you who are here, you can share in the chat do you gather feedback from students? And if so, how? And that could be in formal or informal ways, whether it's just things that you notice or things that you ask them to share formally. What are some of the things you're already doing to gather feedback? And this could be both faculty and staff roles, so it doesn't even necessarily have to be students in your classes, but just students you're working with, students um, in campus in any other capacity. I think, love this, Natalie, checking on community guidelines. So that requires establishing community guidelines at the start of the semester, which is an awesome, awesome practice. Um, but then, yeah, often we we do that at the beginning of the semester, but don't necessarily refer back to them. So I love that you're getting feedback on how they're going. That way you can adjust and the students can kind of self-assess. Are they upholding those guidelines too? Max, sometimes you think it's too much. Is there ever too much feedback? <laughs> Polls, exit tickets, formal surveys, generally asking them how things are going. Mm -hmm. Rachel noting, SOE students are not shy about providing feedback, absolutely. Hmm, Erica having that invitation in the syllabus, so really formally putting that language in there so students know that that's part of your value system, part of what you expect. Yeah, so thank you all for sharing these ideas. Is there anything, Gavin, Reba, or Kutsi, as you're reading through them, anything that really stands out to you that you want to highlight or validate? 
Um, I second what you said, Hannah, about Max comment. I don't think that there's ever too much of a checking in thing. I think you can always check in. I would say I love Erica's comment about um, inviting students to uh, ask, share questions about topics they don't necessarily in the, see in the course plan. I I love that um, uh, involvement of students in the kind of the flow of the course experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would probably uplink that as well. If you have a communication in the syllabus, it's like professor welcome this feedback is an important thing um, for students to like hear sometimes and think that that's just a great way to start off this semester um, i also really like sydney's comment um in terms of just like as you're doing It's a little bit challenging to hear you, Kutsia. Um, maybe depending on who's talking around you. I don't know if we have headphones or I just want to let you know that. Oh, okay, you do have headphones. Because Reva was clearer than Kutsia for some reason. But... All right. Yeah, so it seems like a lot of us are already doing this. And maybe what this workshop will talk about is how we can expand that, how we can think about not just gathering feedback, but working with our students even to applying that feedback. Uh, so thank you all for sharing and lots of great ideas in that chat. So by the end of this session, we'll be able to explain the value of partnering with students to enhance equity and belonging in a variety of teaching and learning contexts. So in the classroom and out, for those of you who are staff members working with students, identify various approaches to co-creation through partnership, and we'll define what we mean by co-creation and plan at least one way that you will partner with students and incorporate student voice and perspective this semester and beyond, potentially. So we're gonna start by talking about the idea of normalizing, gathering, and implementing student feedback, which seems like based on your chat responses is already happening. So I'm gonna hand it over to Reba to share this quote and kind of talk through a little bit about um, the intent behind this quote. Hi, I apologize for any noise. I hope this is a little better. Um, Katia and I are going to change location soon. <laughs> Hopefully that will help. But this is a quote that I said during one of our CTRL student partner meetings. And it was about some professors might get in their mind that when syllabus week is done, the class is set, but it's never too late to change. And I feel I take that kind of mentality on as a student as well. I always feel like when it's too late in the semester, it feels like I can't come back in a class that I may be struggling in, but I know that it's never too late to change. So I think that also applies to professors as well, especially like with classroom structure and student feedback, it's never too late to hear back from students. Excellent. And I'm going to put in the chat and this will be in the follow-up email as well, but uh, just a link to our student partners page where you can read about um, all the different projects that the student partners, Reba Kutsia and the others have worked on over multiple semesters that they've worked with CTRL. And where these quotes that you'll see throughout this presentation come from is um, Gavin and I meet with the student partners regularly and talk about, uh, based on the point in the semester, talk about what's going on for them, getting feedback from them on different aspects of teaching. Um, so this is when we were talking about kind of co-creating policies with students or co-creating the syllabus with students, which we'll talk a little bit more about throughout this workshop. All right, so when we think about feedback um, between instructor and student, we can think about it as like a formative assessment loop. Um, we're assessing teaching, we're assessing learning on an ongoing basis, right? So kind of putting together this loop where um, there might be feedback on learning going on, where the instructor is providing feedback to students on their learning. Uh, when we say implicit or explicit, implicit might be you're designing an activity or you're designing a quiz or you're designing some type of writing check-in that will provide students with feedback just based on did they get um, their answer right or wrong or how are they doing on that assignment. Or explicit is you're actually giving them feedback comments, say, on their writing or on their assignments. 
And then ideally, the students apply that feedback to improve their learning. Um, but we can also think about feedback in the other direction where students are giving you feedback on your teaching. And that also can be implicit or explicit. Um, implicit being when you say, seeing certain student expressions or you're noticing um, certain, um, you know, the way students are interacting with an assignment or something. Whereas explicit might be you're asking them directly, how did that go for you? Or what do you think about this assignment? Or how was that um, new activity we tried? Or did you like the readings or not? Or what did you think about the readings? So that all being feedback you could apply to improve your teaching. So these things can be mutually beneficial. It's sort of two separate feedback processes going on that work simultaneously, feedback on teaching and feedback on learning. So we wanna think about all that uh, being connected. Um, I'm seeing Erica's comment in the chat that syllabi are not contracts between students and professors and had a student call that once and it was and was upset that it could change throughout the semester. That's a great point. And um, that being that, yeah, students wanting, like some students seeing the changing of the syllabus being responsive and being inclusive of what they might want or need versus another student being upset that things changed. Um, Reba and Kutsia, I don't know if you've heard that comment or see that comment and wanna to speak to that a little bit. And maybe how can an instructor clarify that syllabi are up for changing and help students see that as a good thing? I think definitely establishing that, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, that was really clear. Okay, okay perfect. Yeah. I hope, I think establishing that just in the first week during syllabi week is always really helpful, as well as um, encouraging students and reminding them of that. Um, so if a student has a complaint, maybe when you notice that a lot of students are asking for extensions on assignments or you're going through a difficult topic during the course, um, I think that would be a helpful time to remind students that this is you're, you encourage co-creation, you encourage uh, your students to help give you feedback on how you can make the classroom be a better space that works for both you and your students. So. Yeah, and I would agree with everything Reba has said. I think that I also appreciate when professors have like built-in days in the syllabus that are more flexible. So if we're behind in a lesson for some reason or another, um, we have that built-in day to make up for it. But also if like students need just like a day to come in and talk to the professor and like work with their peers on homework assignments, like towards the end of the semester when it usually gets busy, um, I've had professors build in those days um, and they just kind of, they show that the professor cares um, and is willing to be uh, flexible. And I think that's important. Yeah, maybe what I'm hearing too and, and thinking about in terms of this idea of a contract is that maybe certain things are set, like the assignments are set, but the schedule is up for change or the readings are up for change or um, the you know participation policy is up for change. Um, that way students have that security and clarity around, okay, I know these are the assignments that are expected of me and that's not going to just change last minute notice, but the other things are flexible and responsive. So kind of the best of both sides of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you for asking that question, Erica, because I think that's an important point to bring up. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Reba to share another um, point made in our discussions. Um, so this quote is by one of our student partners who was here with us last semester. Her name is Kamaya, and she said that checking in with students to provide them feedback on how they're doing in the class and asking for feedback on teaching are both important, but are two different things. Think about how they go together. And Kamaya actually did a really great project last semester on together it focuses on co-creation and how to allow your students to help collaborate with you um, in terms of bettering your ability to teach your students. So I think what Kamaya always emphasizes and what we emphasized when we collaborated on a project at our, our first semester at CTRL was um, open communication between students and professors. So whether that means checking in with your students, the simple, how are you doing, but also 
to whatever level you're comfortable with, letting students know how you're doing. It really helps create a foundation of honesty and also encourages students to come with you when they have issues, whether it be with the syllabus, whether it be with something else going on in their lives. But I think that helps students in terms of feeling more comfortable coming to you and maybe commenting on your teaching because I know that can be a very daunting task for some students. We don't know if professors are always going to be open to our feedback. So I think Kamaya explains that really well. Yariba. Now getting into maybe some of the more practical side of everything that you've been saying. So I think Reba and Kutsi have highlighted very well the value of gathering feedback. So how do we do this? Um, how do we make this a part of our normal class routine? So I think a lot of these ideas came up in what you shared in the chat before, informal check-ins, um, verbal and nonverbal um, or written, end of class written reflections, also known as exit tickets. I think that idea came up in the chat. So having students answer a question that they then hand into you on their way out of class, uh, anonymous polls and surveys, and when introducing new assignments, leaving space and time for questions, comments, clarifications, and just highlighting that point, there's no need to wait until mid-semester or end of semester. Um, and then some ideas for questions we might ask. Um, so something like, we tried something new. How did it go? What could we do different next time? How is our class weekly structure working for you? Are expectations for assignments clear? Um, how is the homework for you? So asking students for their honest opinions on how the course is working for them, that helps to build rapport, helps to demonstrate you care about their learning, and allows both you and students to correct the miscommunications early on. Um, let me see how many people are in here. It's not okay. Um, so now, kind of in this transition between talking about feedback and then later on in the session, we're going to talk about uh, co-creation and moving beyond feedback to co-creation, I wanted to give you a chance to pause and collaborate with colleagues or do some individual reflection. If you're not up for talking with colleagues, um, this can just be a time to, to reflect on everything you've heard so far and start drafting out some ideas for yourself. So I'll take about 10 minutes. I'll open up some breakout rooms for those of you who are interested in talking about this with peers, um, but for those who aren't, I ask that you please stay in the meeting and it's totally fine for you to sit in the main room and just kind of um, individually reflect or start to draft out some of the things you might wanna work on. So, and maybe Reba and Kutsia will go into one of the breakout rooms if we wanna talk more with them. Um, so thinking about in those rooms, what are some things you already sense you might want to adjust in your teaching this semester? And how will you gather feedback from students? What are some questions you might ask or when and help? How will you ask them? Um, or you can even um, reflect on other things that have come up in the session so far. So yeah, I'll make relatively large rooms in case anybody stays in the main room. And like I said, the breakout rooms will open, but feel free to stay in the main room if you'd like. And then we'll start back up in about 10 minutes with the rest of the workshop. Great, right, welcome back from those breakout rooms. Um, I think Reba and Kutsia were able to make it into both rooms, right? So um, either if you two want to share anything interesting that was coming up or follow-up questions that people might have, um, or anybody else can feel free to unmute. There was a unique idea that came up in your room. We'll open the floor for faculty to go first if they'd like. I can share just like a little bit about like what our group talked about. We kind of started off with like 
there being a little bit of tension between what we're actually able to do with the a 15 week semester and then what students may need from us and kind of like grappling with when we do ask for feedback, how do we incorporate that without falling short? And also understanding that you're gonna get a variety of different pieces of feedback. You're gonna get conflicting feedback from different students. And so how do you incorporate a lot of different things into your unique class setting, whatever that may be, um, to meet the needs of all of your students and, and kind of like to do that and also like, in what ways are you trying to receive feedback and how how do students want to give you feedback is another thing um we didn't get to investigate like some of some of those different pieces very very um like thoroughly but those were just like some of the things that we were kind of like chatting a little bit about yeah absolutely there's a lot of a lot of nuance a lot of difference across contexts when it comes to feedback um and maybe, and I'm interested to hear what Reba and Kutzi have to say in response, but what's coming to mind for me is just the importance of transparency and being super honest about if there are certain things you're not responding to, why not? And why can't certain things change or why are certain things the way they are? Um, and working with faculty a lot on mid-semester um, mid -semester course analyses or other mid-semester feedback processes, um, Sometimes these conversations don't actually lead to change, but they lead to greater transparency, which then improves students' buy-in, improves students' motivation. Um, it helps instructor and student realize, oh, that's why we're doing those things that we're doing. Um, and that wasn't clear to students before. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo Hannah's point that I, I'm interested in Reba and uh, Kazia's thoughts on this, but I'll also add that um, that yeah, feedback is like so many things. Something it's a process that people kind of take for granted, as though people know how to give feedback uh, instinctively. But um, very much uh, often, as often as the case is, uh, folks need prompting um, about what kind of feedback you're interested in um, as an instructor. Um, which is not to say that you don't want to encourage students to express their honest opinions, but um, I often find that when asking for feedback, it's helpful to, to say, you know, keep the responses to um, specific actionable recommendations. Um, the specific is helpful because then you have an idea of exactly what it is that people are interested in, in you know, uh, giving their feedback on and, and actionable being things that um, are within your power to to potentially affect, um, as Hannah pointed out, often instructors may get feedback on things they they can't do anything about. But uh, like Hannah said, transparency and honest communication will will generally take you far. Yeah. Um. Just to go off of Gavin's point, I do love the notion of specifically prompting your students, explaining to them what you're looking for, because a lot of the times professors will ask very like open-ended or vague questions to me about what they're looking for feedback on. And it forces me to like rack my mind, but also remain kind of neutral or censored in my response. So one thing I really appreciate about either the SETs or mid-semester feedback is the anonymity uh, aspect of it. So putting out anonymous surveys, allowing students to freely and without consequences be able to give you feedback on your classroom is really important, I think. And I would say from the teacher perspective is always, um, I would say check yourself in the sense of when you receive feedback, uh, really work through what your initial response may be. Are you meeting them with like, oh, how dare they comment on this? Because I, of course, students understand that as well. If I write like a really good paragraph in an essay and a teacher comments on it, I'm like, no, I like my immediate response is to defend, to defend that. Um, so definitely try to work through that as a professor, because at the end of the day, every student in your classroom is coming in with different positionality, whether it be their identity, their life circumstances, or simply how they're going to be able to show up in your classroom. So 
as a professor teaching that class, you're not going to ever be able to fully understand that, which is why feedback can be such a critical and useful tool in co-creation. So, Yeah, just building on that, I think that there's definitely a delicate balance between um, questions that are too specific and questions that are too vague in terms of feedback. So like working through that yourself um, before you ask for that feedback is an important part. Like, um, for instance, a question like, how do you feel about this class um, would not get the student, like would not get the responses from the students that you might need to improve your instruction versus like, how do you feel about this like very specific reading? But more generally, it's just, like, I think finding that balance is important. Um, I also think like being responsive to feedback, like um, it's, it's definitely an emote, like it's definitely labor on students to provide feedback as well. And students are having to do that reflection. Um, and, we wouldn't want to feel like if we provide feedback, the student, the professor is not going to take that in or like redirect instruction in any way. Like I think it's helpful if there's that trust that my feedback is valuable and is helping me and my professor improve our shared classroom experience. That actually leads really well into your quote here that we had on the next slide, if you want to read that. And um, yeah, absolutely. This anymore. is also one of our meetings. Um, and I said, professors should be open to constructive criticism and be prepared to change their practice, asking students, how are you? And listening to the honest answers. Um, the time that they take to connect with students and ask for feedback leads to much deeper learning. And it could really start with the very simple question, I think, of just how are you doing today? Um, so I, I, I think that being able to critically reflect on uh, the shared experience because we're all learning together is a really important aspect of um, going into receiving feedback. Yeah, and so that leads us into thinking about what is co-creation or what does it mean to co-create our teaching and learning environments um, and thinking about moving towards co-creation. So feedback, especially SETs and mid-semester surveys and some of these other more um, informal ways of collecting feedback um, may be familiar to us and as we expressed in the chat in the beginning, but then thinking about what is the difference between feedback and co-creation or the spectrum of how students might be positioned in your course. So uh, maybe a traditional model where we're not even asking for feedback would be that students are just receivers they're receivers of instruction, they're passive. Um, the instructor is making all the decisions and is not asking for feedback about anything. Um, ideally, we're moving towards the right, right? So, and everything we've talked about so far would be more like student as informer, where students are being asked how things are going, being asked their opinions and suggestions on things. Students are providing feedback and suggestions for changes. And I think that point has come up a few times that it's not about providing complaints, but it's a, about providing actionable things that can be done to improve the learning experience. Um, but then thinking even further along this spectrum towards co-creation would be students as active partners in the learning experience. So not just how are things going, but what can we do together to improve this assignment? Or how can we work together to um, change the, uh, the way we're approaching this course? Kind of almost giving the students more agency in adapting the course or improving the course or changing the course. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over yeah. to Gavin now to talk about what is co-creation, the benefits of it, and then uh, Reba and Katsia will speak more to that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, well, Hannah kind of introduced the idea, um, but I'll uh, put, a, put a fine point on it. Um, so what is co-creation? Well, the goal of co-creation is to achieve deeper understanding of teaching and learning through shared analysis and revision. Um, it entails uh, respect, recipro reciprocity, and shared responsibility between students and faculty. Um, so this means it can include making collaborative and transparent decisions about changing our practices in some instances and not in others keeping in mind that uh, both students and instructors are equal partners. So um, I know that some instructors are anxious. If, if students come to them and they have a suggestion, well, does co-creation mean that I have to 
implement every suggestion that students have? Well, no, because you are an equal partner, which means that you also have a say in whether a uh, decision is implemented. So keeping in mind that uh, it's, it's an equal uh, relationship. Um, so yeah, co-creation includes um, developing mutual respect for the individual and shared rationales behind these choices. So even when you may disagree uh, with uh, what a student proposes, you still get a deeper understanding of where they're coming from and why they might want to, um, to advance a certain idea of how to uh, envision a class relationship. Um, so we've t that's basically what co-creation is, but uh, I think it's important to also acknowledge some of the benefits of co-creation. Um, and I think this is really where the, uh, you know, a lot of people may say, well, you know, co-creation sounds like it's a lot of work. Um, is there anything, is there anything I'm getting out of it? Well, you'll be happy to know that research has found several concrete uh, benefits from co-creation, including greater engagement uh, in the classroom and increased awareness of uh, metacognitive awareness of uh, a stronger sense of identity and improved teaching and classroom experience. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that these benefits are not uh, one-sided, they're not uh, asymmetrical, but both students and instructors equally share in the benefits of co-creation. So for example, increased awareness uh, for students may look like students are becoming more aware of how they learn, how they approach the learning process, taking greater ownership over their learning success. And for an instructor, it may be becoming more aware of why we choose to enact certain policies or instructional uh, design choices in our courses. And thus being able to, once we understand these decisions, articulate them to others, say in casual conversation, uh, if that's your conversation topic, or in a teaching portfolio. Um, so there are multiple benefits of co-creation that both students and instructors can enjoy. And I think we have a quote that may uh, emphasize this. Um, is this uh, Kudzia now who is reading? Yeah. Um, having the professor say, I want you to self-advocate and I want you to come to me if something isn't working for you and encouraging that kind of behavior with their students is another way to make the class more equitable. Um, just opening up that space um, and welcoming feedback is um, really an important part. And this is one of my peers, Marie, who um, had talked about this idea and I just want to uplift it here. Absolutely. Thank you, Kizia. Um that's an important point to note. And I feel like the um, uh, classroom space is, is really uh, shifted when this uh, co-creation process is initiated. It ceases to become the um, that uh, left end of the spectrum that Hannah pointed out where students are just, you know, empty vessels waiting to be filled with knowledge and shifts it into something different. Hannah, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, Co-creation can really be a space to create a micro society within a classroom uh, where all are contributing to its functioning. Um, this can mean uh, many things, depending on what your goals for co-creation are. Um, you could be working together on developing a specific component of a class, such as a norm, a guideline, or expectations. Um, you could be deciding upon specific readings or other course content. Um, such as, uh, you know, videos, podcasts, whatever the uh, medium may be, um, developing specific policies. Um, and to Rachel's point earlier in the chat, these would be course specific policies, not university policies. I don't think you can co-create university policies at the class level, but, um, you know, we, we can dream. Um, but these would be course specific policies such as uh, participation or late work or attendance, what have you. You could also co-create assignments or even grading structures for the course. Um, it's really up to you and students to decide what it is that you feel is most important to work on within your specific context. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll say, I'll point oh, yeah, out that, um, you know, we're not saying here that in order for it to be co-creation, you have to do all of these things. No, it's certainly not. Just 
starting with one, I think a few people put in the chat before that you're already have tried creating um, norms or guidelines together. And so that kind of leads into, okay, now, now what might we try? Um, that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. No, no. In fact, that's, that's why I made the point about your specific context. Some people just don't have the time. Um, the desire may be there, but the reality is that uh, you only have so much, uh, you know, real estate in your classes to dedicate to this co-creation process because it does take time to do well and to ensure that all parties feel um, like the experience is an equitable one, as I will be talking about in this next slide. Yeah, well, I, I did want to oh, go on. Um, sorry. If Reba and Kutsi had any follow ups to this slide um, or comments on that idea of the micro society or mm. um, I think in conversations with the student partners, we've also talked a lot about um, there are a lot of social science classes at AU and um, not knowing exactly what everybody here teaches, but a lot of the times we're teaching about content um, and then kind of thinking about, well, how do we enact that content in the way that we run our classes, right? So any comments from you both on this concept or other ways to think about it? Yeah, um, I first just want to applaud Gavin for explaining that so well. And also Hannah for emphasizing that we students do not expect every single one of these things to be implemented. Um, I don't even think as a student, I could keep up with all those things like that. <laughs> but we appreciate the effort regardless. I can speak on that from the student perspective. And in relation to what somebody said before about university policies, um, we understand that sometimes uh, what professors wanna do and how they wanna accommodate for their students' needs may not always align with what administration provides you not only the resources for, but also even allows you to do. But I would always encourage professors to not particularly go against university policies. I, I don't expect you to put your careers on the line, but making sure that you're kind of meeting your students halfway, regardless of the system that you may be teaching under, because that same system is restrictive, not only to faculty, but to students as well. A really good example of that is um, ASAC accommodations. Um, as some of you may know, it is very difficult to go through the process of getting official documentations for disabilities or accommodations. So I would always open the space or I've had professors in the past say that if you do not have official documentation from the ASAP office, um, come to me, talk about it, talk about your accommodations and we can work a way out. So even if you cannot fully accommodate for what that student is asking for, I think really setting an open mind and not restricting it just to you need to prove that you need this, this and this from me more so opening up a dialogue and making sure that students feel comfortable in the first place to come to you is very important. And to see if you have anything to add. No, I, I think Reba put it <laughs> perfect. All right, I will hand it back over to Gavin to talk through these steps. Um, yes, thank you. And and thank you, Reba and Katia. Um, once you have the, the idea and the goal to co-create an aspect of your course, um, where do you go from there? Well, um, obviously it would be helpful to have a foundation from which to co-create so that everyone feels like they are a part of this process, um, they feel included, um, and that the process is equitable. So a great place that we suggest is through collaborative norm setting. Um, one potential way to approach this uh, are these steps that we will highlight here. Um, let's say, for example, you wanted to um, co-create a course policy on attendance. Um, you would ask your students a question or two about, uh, about attendance policies. Um, and what we would suggest is to give students time to reflect on those questions individually. Um, this ensures that they have uh, a few minutes to write down their thoughts and opinions um, before they enter into a group conversation um, so that those uh, individual level thoughts and opinions aren't lost once they become uh, mixed in with other people's thoughts and opinions. Um, after people have had an opportunity to think on their own, next would come a small group discussion uh, in which students could talk either with a peer or in a group with uh, about their ideas and 
haven't a chance to see uh, common themes among them and really uh, come together and try to identify shared commonalities between these uh, opinions. Um, after students have had an opportunity to speak in smaller groups, then comes the whole class discussion in which each group shares their at least one idea um, to create a combined list of ideas. And finally, the instructor takes this uh, refined list and uh, presents it to the class for approval. Um, be sure to check for uh, potential revisions or clarifications along the way. But this process from individual reflection to small group to whole class ensures that people are able to have their own opinions heard by others, acknowledged, and to collaborate to develop a common set of goals and ideas. Um, it's, a, it's just one potential model, but we encourage you to, to, whatever way you choose to approach this, to consider ensuring how students' voices can be incorporated into the entire process, um, whether that be at the individual level or at the collective level. Um, any other thoughts, Hannah? Um, if not, then I will point out some guiding questions that you might consider asking students when they're beginning to co-create. Um, these you'll see are fairly broad, but not too broad. You know, that, that balance, like Reaper pointed out, is specific, but not too uh, specific. So what do we think class participation should look like? Um, when you are a member of a class or group, what guidelines for interactions you might uh, you most val do you most value? Uh, what can we do to establish a more positive classroom environment? What can we do to make the course more accessible? What other topics would we like to explore together? And finally, what values or principles should we prioritize as a class? Um, you'll see that we've highlighted the word we because the emphasis here is this is a collective enterprise. You, the instructor, and the students are a single unit, partners, working to achieve a common set of goals. So these are really questions for everyone to consider. Um, and I feel like next is a, okay, one more, I, one more slide before we get into another quote. Um, the scale of co-creation, while we've talked about it so far, is on the level of a individual course component or a series of individual course components, it can be bigger than this. You can think of uh, co-creation on the scale of a full course redesign, a curriculum redesign, or even a program redesign. Uh, you'll see this little uh, triangle on the right, this image of learning outcomes, assessments, and instructional, instructional activities is just a reminder to think about how alignment fits into this picture, making sure that the overall goal of a course, overall goal of a program is considered whenever you engage in co-creation. It's not just one aspect, not just thinking about instructional activities, not just thinking about assessments, but thinking about how all of these factors fit together into a cohesive whole. And with that, I think we may move on to, oh, no, please go on, Hannah. Well, I was gonna say, I noticed, Rebecca Comfort, you're here. I don't mean to call you out, but I know um, Rebecca Comfort is with the AU Core Complex Problems, and they've done work in this um, realm, I think, working with students on, say, assessment, um, you know, the office, the new Office of um, Academic Integrity, and Allison Thomas have been working with students on um, academic integrity policy and things. So it can certainly, for those of you who are here, or know people who this might work for outside of the classroom, but even on a larger scale. Um, I'm happy, or we're happy to meet with you to help think through what does that look like to work with students. And there are plenty of examples of this already happening on campus that are really inspiring. Thank you, Hannah. That's that's very good to point out. Always good to give uh, flowers when they're due. Oh, All right. Gonna, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so I've talked a lot. Um, so now I'd like to hear from you all. Uh, if you would be so kind in the chat, please share. What challenges do you anticipate regarding co-creation? Um, I'm a very positive person, so I like to think of all the good things, but uh, 
it's also important whenever you make a plan to consider what might go wrong or what some issues might be as you as you proceed. So what challenges do you anticipate regarding co-creation? I don't mean to take up space again, but I think one of the challenges that I've faced with my students is, um, I think it kind of goes back to what someone else was saying about um, like having open-ended questions for students. I think a lot of students just don't know what it is that they can bring to the table in terms of co-creation. And so I think it's like uh, offering up examples or like more probing questions to say like, if we're going to talk about this topic in this week, what are some things you'd like to focus on within that or, you know, so on and so forth. And just kind of like opening up, I think, additional pathways for students to actually co-create in the classroom or with assignments and things like that. I think there's also just like a level of like, and which is something we talked a little bit about in our uh, like breakout room of like, it's not the norm for instructors and professors to be asking students to be involved. And so kind of like acknowledging a little bit of like, discomfort in that um, and and like some support in like you know reassur reassuring like I, I'm not I'm asking you to help you know make the classroom more what it needs to be for you to learn and, and I'm not going to be defensive about if you give something you know as a like potential offering um, for for the class that I don't agree with I'm not going to be defensive about it I might just explain why that might not be best for like our class setting or how we can kind of like work together from there. But I think oftentimes it's like a, you don't know what you don't know. And so students may not feel like they can offer anything of value. Um, and so like sure. reassuring that. That's a great point, Amanda. Um, Reba, Katia, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I think that we're okay. We might, I just want to read that uh, chat in the, oh, that comment in the chat. No problem. No, I, I, I like that point. And I will say that um, it's, it's probably a very common one that uh, students generally have not been asked their opinion. Um, last semester, the uh, student partners did a great canvassing event where they asked students their thoughts about uh, one thing that could be improved or one thing that instructors should know about students' opinions in the classroom. And, uh, and a lot of students were taken aback. They didn't know what to say because they'd never been asked their opinion before. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's uh, probably a great uh, you know, area where transparency and, uh, and just having a open conversation about it would probably be a good solution. And I think Matt makes a good point in the chat of that, you know, you, you are the expert in your subject matter and, and um, in most cases, the expert in pedagogy. I have the privilege of working with the School of Education students who also know a lot about pedagogy and sometimes bring some really awesome stuff um, from other classes into class. But uh, for the most part, we'll know more about teaching and learning, but students are the experts in being a student. So, um, I think when Gavin was defining co-creation before, you are partners and, and this idea of reciprocity, but not necessarily playing equivalent roles in the partnership, but you're playing roles that are uh, relevant and fitting to your expertise, whether that's expertise as in the student experience or expertise in the discipline or in pedagogy and naming that. Um, we also, we have a challenges and solutions slide that um, mirrors a lot of what Amanda was sharing and what has already come up. Um, but this idea that the biggest challenge being that overcoming the resistance and disrupting the traditional power dynamics and academic hierarchies. Um, you named discomfort, Amanda, so getting comfortable being uncomfortable, which requires active listening, trust building, guidance, reassurance, and validation, which can be new for students, but also new for us, um, something to practice. 
um, navigating the institutional structures, practices, and norms, a lot of which might not align with this. Um, so with work that can sometimes be considered countercultural, we start small and build up um, and address aspects of instruction that you do have the authority to change and build that trust that way. And what does it mean to establish an inclusive co-creation approach, considering whose voices are heard and whose are not, um, reframing perceptions of those who traditionally have been marginalized. Um, so in thinking of, you know, what, what students are we asking for to work with us or which students are we asking for their opinions on how things are? Um, Riba or Kutsi, any comments on these challenges or other challenges that you feel like we've discussed or you've experienced? Yeah, I would definitely add that, like, if you haven't asked for feedback and you start asking for feedback tomorrow, it might seem like a daunting task. Um, but I think that starting somewhere is really important. Um, I, I definitely think that having built in that foundation of trust from day one is important. But like Reba said earlier, um, you can make changes throughout the semester. Um, and I think that starting somewhere is just really crucial. Um, so if you choose to implement some of the things that we've talked about today in your classroom tomorrow, um, that might seem like a daunting task, but it, it would definitely be fulfilling is the thought that I'm having. Yeah. Um, and just to comment on what Hannah said about certain students maybe being more willing to participate and going to certain students to um, give you feedback, um, I think it's important to remain equitable and also acknowledge that students may be coming from a place of mistrust or like Kitsia mentioned before, it's a very daunting task to self-advocate for yourself. Um, we think that because we're university students, like it may be something we know or like know how to do, but it is that's a difficult task to do even in the workplace, especially challenging in the classroom. So keeping in mind that power dynamic as Gavin spoke about before, where you're a professor who ultimately controls this grade of the student, um, is very pivotal to their learning process and has to come to class to see you every day. Those may be factors that definitely come into play with how they're willing to give you feedback, when they're willing to give you feedback, and how that may inform what they consider like uh, realistic to be able to contribute to the co-creation process. I know speaking personally from my own experience and also um, from talking to my own peers, um, a lot of students don't realize that a lot of the practices they've become used to and have like forced themselves to adapt to are not fair to them. And they don't realize that because they're just really pushing themselves and like working really hard to try and get through the semester, but they're they're in the face of very unfair um, curriculum often. So it can be really hard to pull that out of the students. So it's a patient process, but making it clear that you want to hear back from students is very pivotal to that. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna move on to our last shared quote and then we'll wrap things up. Yeah, um, something I wanna highlight that one of uh, my fellow student partners brought up was trust, report, and community are all important. Students need to know that they will be heard. I think that they really are the foundation of a successful, inclusive, welcoming learning environment, but also just like great teaching and learning for like, to make great teaching and learning possible in the classroom. Um, and I think I think that those really are key elements of that. And if I could jump in really quickly, Ali is actually um, in the STEM area of our schools. So uh, she does some great work, um, especially if you want to check it out on how um, to include inclusive pedagogy in STEM classrooms, because it's not always something that's at the forefront of STEM uh, educators' minds, but it is important to keep in mind that this can also apply to any subject. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Reba and Kutsia. Um, I'm actually going to switch to the slide. Reba, if you want to talk a little bit more about um, where the Student Partners Program is going and the opportunity for faculty to work with you. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. So um, this semester, um, Hannah and Gavin decided to bring me back on as a student consultant in some ways. It's also called um, on the form uh, section on the website where it says, ask a student partner. I will be one of the student partners that you're asking. So 
as you can see, whether that be a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, uh, email conversation that we can have. I can, I'm willing to sit in on classes. I would love to look over any course materials you'd like to send me. Basically just a conversation. Um, this is a new thing to me. Um, it's a new project um, that we're implementing and I'm very, very excited about it. So feel free to reach out, um, whether it be simply just me encouraging you or validating you as a professor um, or just appreciating the fact on behalf of the rest of your students that you had the willingness to come to a student and to accept the student perspective um, is something that I'm really thankful to have the opportunity to do. So can't wait to work with some of you. Yeah, and feel free to share these resources too with colleagues. I know there aren't very many of us here and a lot of people had messaged me, I think, um, at least for CAS, there was another big event going on and whatnot. So um, feel free to share this with anyone you think might be interested. Um, so I'll I'll do our, our normal thank you closing slide. And then uh, we do have some time that if anybody has um, additional questions about anything we talked about or questions for Reba and Kutsia, uh, feel free to stick around. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Kutsia and Reba, for your contributions and um, all of your insights. This was so incredibly valuable. Um, I encourage you all to, if you want to consult, to connect with Reba before you even connect with me or uh, my colleagues, but um, just the typical announcements, you can always request a consult with the teaching and learning team. We have tons of upcoming events and um, resources on our website as well, but I really want to highlight what the student partners have all created. To Natalie's question, um, yeah, I will send a follow-up email with the slides. Um, and all of these links, and I'll probably even um, review the chat and, and share anything that has come up in there. And what else? Um, and this was recorded. So if at any point you want to rewatch it or share it with a colleague, um, it'll be available relatively soon. Lindsay's also put in the chat um, the evaluation survey. So we really appreciate that, especially I think Kutsi and Reba will appreciate your feedback. This being a session on feedback, we appreciate your feedback. Um, so please fill that out with um, comments and any follow-up questions. Any, does anybody have a last question for our student partners that they'd like to share while we have the time? If not, um, Reba and Kutsia, any final thoughts for Gavin? Um, no, thank you. Just uh, We really appreciate you joining the session. It, it definitely means a lot. And it'll mean a lot to your students for them to know whether you tell them that you came to this session or not, but to know that you're putting in the effort to better your teaching practice. And I know as a student myself who's still going and struggling through school, I appreciate it. So. Yeah, the, I I would echo that. You know, uh, trying is noticed. So I think it's definitely a good idea to 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 make an effort and to you know be transparent about it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your week.